Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. We need a base load of dispatchable energy that can respond to demand. And nuclear fusion, like fossil fuels, uh, uh, fits that bill. So nuclear fusion is the kind of revolution that we would need in order to uh, get to net zero faster than I'm afraid we may otherwise do. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, we, we will be reliant on other solutions like carbon capture. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Wake Smith, lecturer at Yale College. Welcome to the show today. Very kind of you to have me. All right. Now, uh, let's kind of give uh, the listeners a big picture of um, some of the findings, more recent uh, AR6 Working Group 2 report from IPCC, just to give everyone a, a, a sense in terms of what they indicate as where we are headed in terms of uh, temperature rise and what your thoughts are around that. Well, the, the AR6 is painting a less optimistic picture than had been painted in prior uh, IPCC reports and a less optimistic picture than was intended when the Paris Agreement was agreed back in 2015. The hope in the Paris Agreement was that we might limit uh, climate change to no more than a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in global average surface temperatures, certainly no more than two C. And yet on the pathway that we are now on, 3C seems like a much more likely outcome, at least to me, and is the middle of the road outcome that the IPCC uh, recent report illustrated. Well, you know, we've had uh, other guests on the show that believe that even those uh, latest figures that's been published is still underestimating the potential uh, projection or where things are going to go. Um, and I think in your book, uh, Pandora's Tool Toolbox, you talk about some of the challenges in terms of the, the complexity, difficulty, the cost, and just the time it's going to take to get to that net zero emission. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. But more importantly, I think really I, so much of the focus, uh, both from a corporate as well as from, from um, government agencies, is this notion of trying to reach net zero. But you talk about something that, frankly, isn't talked about enough, which is even if we reach that, there could be more issues thereafter. That's right. I liken it to driving on a road twice as far as you intended to drive. If you do that, you don't get to the same destination later. You get to a very different destination. And that is what would happen if we defer achieving net zero until the beginning of the next century, rather than in the middle of this century, which is the aspiration of everybody, I suppose. But I I don't see that it is realistic that we will get to net zero by the uh, middle of this century. And the problem really is that one can think of what informs the climate uh, in, with the analogy of a bathtub. It's not the spigot coming into the bathtub that informs the global climate. It's the water level in the bathtub when we turn the spigot off. So if we keep running the spigot longer before we finally turn it off, before we finally get to net zero, the bathtub will be much more full than we had intended. And it is, again, that water level that defines the future climate. The very bad news is that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere gets leached out of the atmosphere by the natural systems in a time span measured in centuries to millennia. So it's not as if once we get to net zero, temperatures snap back to where they were. They remain at whatever peak they have achieved 
for many human generations, and people thereafter are going to have to live with those temperatures. And if they're too hot, that's going to create a, a, an ongoing series of damages. Now, I think um, because we're seeing so much attention around electric vehicle or general electrification, both on the industrial side as well as uh, commercial, I mean, consumer passenger side, is that we sometimes have this impression that we're making great progress. And certainly, you know, you look around in your neighborhood, you see the solar panels that are that are being placed on two rooftops. So the thing is, there is a discrepancy between what we believe is progressing versus the reality. And I think you make the indication, this is just factual, which is that fossil fuels, and we're definitely seeing the effects of the Ukraine, Russia, and the impacts of, you know, gas and oil, is that still makes up 80% of the world's primary energy supply. And the renewables, while it's doing great, is still just a small little percentage. Uh, and then, of course, you have those that are advocating for planting more trees and that somehow that's going to magically uh, get us to net zero. What are your thoughts around some of these things? Well, planting trees is um, such a uh, mismatched solution that it almost amounts to greenwashing. Uh, planting trees is a good thing, but it doesn't sequester the carbon permanently outside of the climate system. That tree will die someday or burn. After all, forest fires is the natural fate of fire of, of forests. Um, and it will return that carbon back to the atmosphere. So trees are a fragile temporary and small scale bank for carbon, what we need to do is A, stop emitting it and B, uh, uh, begin to take it out of the air and put it uh, into the earth's crust, which after all is where we got it from when we drilled for oil in the first place. Uh, we are going to need a, a long list of solutions to the climate problem. And you know things like trees just don't get us there. So again, I, I think going back to this bigger point that you're making, which is that uh, reaching net zero by emission reduction alone isn't enough. And we have to do way more. Uh, and, you and you mentioned carbon removal, storage, essentially carbon sequestration. Uh, but also you, you talk about reducing incoming solar radiation. Um, how would all this work? And the kinds of solutions that we're seeing today, is that enough? Or what do we need to see to scale up to the kind of level that we need? Well, to, to go to a point that you made earlier and I didn't fully uh, pick up on, uh, there is, in my view, naive optimism about how much electrification can solve the problem. Uh, electri uh, electrification is not like trees. Electrification is the real deal, and we absolutely need to do it. But as you earlier mentioned, uh, despite the rapid growth in wind and solar power, the renewable power sector or the new renewable energy sector as a whole is not capturing share uh, because the world demand for energy is continuing to grow and nuclear energy is a proportion of our overall, overall energy supply is not growing. So solar and wind firstly are growing simply to keep up with the growing pie and then they're beginning to backfill the non-growth of nuclear. And so they haven't yet, despite their impressive uh, growth, they haven't yet begun to eat into the 80% of the world's primary energy supply that still derives from fossil fuels. And the Ukraine invasion, I think, demonstrates how difficult it may be to get the entire world to cooperate on a net zero agenda. It's not merely that some countries uh, have to get to net zero. Every country, everybody, every society has to get to net zero before we have finally turned the spigot off. If the West is uh, getting to net zero, but say China and Russia are not, that continues to, to fill the bathtub at, uh, that informs the, the, the future uh, of the planet's climate. So I'm afraid that we will uh, get to net zero more slowly than people think. And if by that time it is too hot, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is too great, then we will, as you've noted, need to begin to take advantage of other uh, climate remedies 
the first and most important of which will be uh, carbon dioxide removal, initially from smokestacks before it goes out into the air. But eventually, once we've gotten rid of all the smokestacks, because we're at net zero, we will need thereafter to begin to take that carbon out of the air, which will be a hugely expensive climate debt that we are nonetheless bequeathing to the future. There are so, so, so many complications, and you talked about many different myriads of that. One is uh, this notion of uh, capacity. So if you look at the current projection, uh, the, the, the demand for electricity is going to double by 2045 is the latest figure that we saw this week, for instance. And that's not including the continuing gr- growing size because of electrification. Uh, so there's this accelerating need or demand for electrification. We haven't even talked about the infrastructure, such as uh, power grids that can even supply that demand, for instance. Um, so that's one issue. And then this other issue of there's always going to be this misalignment of set of incentives. As long as you have certain sovereignties or state actors that benefit economically from selling oil and gas and the commodity price supports that, they will continue to have oil and gas. And then certainly the consumers of it, whether it's China or others, will continue to consume it as long as it relatively uh, levelized cost-wise is cheaper. They'll continue to burn coal, they'll continue to burn petrol and natural gas. So this notion of orchestrating where everyone is on the same page, same boat, to me, is really more of an economic alignment. And how do we, how do we overcome that given the fact that we, what we've seen today? It's going to be difficult is the short answer, and that is among the reasons why I think it's going to be slow going rather than a luge-like plunge down a slope to net zero. Uh, Other reasons for that same thing are the fact that the population is still growing. The expectations are that the world, uh, which has 7.6 billion people or so today, may top out at the end of this century at 10 or 11 billion. Well, if there's roughly a third more people on the earth uh, by the end of this century, all other things being equal, that will uh, create demand for a third more energy. And moreover, Uh, The people in the global south aspire to the energy-rich lifestyle that the people in the global north now live. So those folks aren't going to vote easily for less energy or more expensive energy. Uh, Everyone will want more energy and cheaper energy. And at least for the time being, that likely means the continuation of fossil fuels, because in many applications and in most places, Uh, They are the cheapest option. That's why people are utilizing them. So what's going to be necessary to move the meter? One thing is certainly going to be continued technological breakthroughs. We uh, need uh, for all sorts of new inventions in processes and um, uh, uh, energy sources and so on that will make it cheaper to decarbonize. But I worry that we probably won't decarbonize deeply until it's very inexpensive to do so. And that may be a long ways off. So I'm afraid there are a lot of countercurrents that run contrary Mm -hmm. to where we would want this to ultimately go. And I I think you're right. And I think that that is essentially uh, the net net, unfortunately. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about energy production and then separately about the carbon sequestration as well. On the energy production, uh, you alluded to nuclear, and and I I would imagine you're talking about next generation nuclear fusion. What are your thoughts about nuclear fusion? And particularly, there are a couple of startups, one based out of Massachusetts, one based out of um, uh, Europe, uh, that are really starting to go beyond R&D to true commercialization, uh, developing uh, the ability to have thermomagnetic uh, insulation to actually withhold all that heat safely so that they can actually convert that into usable electricity. Are we getting close? Uh, nuclear fusion has been in the conversation for decades. It, it, it is always tomorrow's technology and is still tomorrow's technology. Whether we are finally uh, getting close to a usable nuclear fusion power grid, I suppose is beyond my uh, personal expertise. I'm more of an observer there than a participant. Certainly, though, nuclear fusion is the kind of technological breakthrough that could change everything we have just been talking about to the extent that nuclear fusion could be ramped up safely and quickly. 
it would revolutionize uh, energy and provide the, the one quality that, uh, in respect of energy, that solar and wind don't. Uh, solar only is generated when the sun is up. Wind is only uh, wind power, of course, uh, de depends on wind. And on a still dark night, neither of those power sources are producing. So in addition to those which uh, can supplement our energy supply, we need a base load of dispatchable energy that can respond to demand and nuclear fusion like fossil fuels, uh, uh, fits that bill. So nuclear fusion is the kind of revolution that we would need in order to uh, get to net zero faster than I'm afraid we may otherwise do. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, we, we will be reliant on other solutions like carbon capture. So let's talk about carbon capture. So some of the solutions that we're seeing today uh, are amounts to essentially large factories that are ground-based that are essentially sucking the air and then purifying it so that it captures the CO2 in the process and then uh, goes to cleaner energy. Essentially a large uh, air conditioning unit, uh, if that makes sense. Um, is that enough? Is that truly scalable? And is that going to get the kind of CO2 uh, metric tons uh, from the atmosphere? Yeah. In, it could, in theory, it may take the rest of the century to stand up a global uh, system that could do that efficiently. And P.S., it's got to do it with clean energy. So we're going to need a lot more solar and wind power and other sorts of uh, non-emissive energy to run that big system. But the size system that we're talking about, the reason trees can't do it, is we're talking about a carbon capture and sequestration industry that would be roughly the size of the entire fossil fuel industry today. So all the gas, all the oil, all the coal, that's how big an industry would be required in order to remove carbon from the atmosphere at roughly the pace that we're now putting it into the atmosphere. But even if we did that, and even if the, the, the uh, generations in the future are going to reserve five or 10% of the global economy's output for this waste remediation process, even in that context, it may take a century or two to pull the carbon back out of the atmosphere. After all, that's how long it took us to put it in the atmosphere. So it's a huge, um, again, debt that we are saddling the future with, and they're not going to be happy about it. Yeah, it's it really kind of weighs down. I think for, for listeners that are really understanding the, the insight from this is that it, it there's a huge urgency, but at the same time, there is a growing, to your point, debt or burden that not only the current generation, but the future generation is going to have to deal with. Now, I think you're probably one of the few that actually framed it in this way, which is that the current size of oil and gas industry uh, would be almost the kind of scale that we will need on the, on the carbon sequestration, sequestration side. That, that, that is huge. Uh, but however, you know, the, the question that, that begs itself is, who's going to pay for that? And where's the demand? So everybody wants cleaner air, everybody wants uh, net zero, but who's willing to actually pay for it? And does it have to come in the form of tax? In one way or another, yes, it does. Uh, and ideally, it needs to be a global tax, but that, that doesn't exist yet. We don't have the uh, governance capacity to cooperate on such a thing. If it were a small tax, maybe, but a, 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 a tax to fund an industry the size of the current fossil fuel <laughs> industry, that's uh, going to be impossible to govern in the future. Um, now, our cutting emissions is also proving impossible to govern in the present. So in that way, maybe it's no different than the emissions problem that we're already having trouble uh, creating effective governance for. But you had asked who is going to pay for this. The just answer would be the rich, uh, the global north, the people who did it 150 and 20 years ago. But none of them are going to be there at the end of this century, uh, the people who are going to pay for it are the people who want to benefit from lowering the 
uh, uh, temperature levels in the future. So unfortunately, it's going to be our grandchildren and great grandchildren who are going to pay for it. And it's going to be the whole world that is going to have to pay for it. There's simply no other feasible solution. So um, going back to a little bit on, on solutions. So we've seen things like essentially, you know, sucking in the air, purifying it to uh, those that are uh, of the opinion that really the, the, the more sustainable solution is regenerative farming, that proper farming, proper agriculture will actually help sequester it. And there's even efforts around micro microbes and, uh, you know, companies like Pivot Bio and uh, Terramera, for example, that's working on different ways to allow for the earth to do its job and not only grow and yield great crops, but also be able to do it in a way that helps reduce the CO2 in the environment, as well as um, you know, helping to enhance the, the oceans and some of the uh, natural systems that basically access the lungs for the earth. But there's also new novel types of solutions that's coming up as well, including the use of lime. So there are certain limes, and I think there are certain parts of the world that have these types of kind of minerals that just naturally uh, if you process it in a certain way, can suck in and absorb that CO2 from the atmosphere without having to have these mechanical parts and machinery running day and night. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of solutions that looks like it could scale to the level that we need? The problem is that we're back into this, I'm afraid to say, naive uh, fantasy that nature-based solutions can be the answer here. They are a part of the answer. And, you know, Bill McKibben, a climate uh, uh, journalist, uh, has a great phrase, there's no silver bullet here, only silver buckshot. And we will need lots of uh, solutions and nature-based solutions will be among them. And all of them, or most of them, uh, are, are a good thing, at least in carbon terms. But the National Academies of Science estimated that trees on the one hand and uh, regenerative agriculture on the other, each of them at their maximal effectiveness might solve 5% of the global problem. They're just nowhere near uh, large enough to uh, solve the, the magnitude of the problem that we've created. The estimate that came out of the uh, 2018 IPCC report trying to make this case, the SR15 report, uh, estimated that it would take one to three Indias of fertile land that we would need to devote to trees uh, in order to limit um, uh, climate change to the goals that we might have, there's not one to three Indias of fertile land sitting unutilized in the world. We, we need that land for agriculture and for uh, housing and, and all sorts of things. It's, it's not, uh, the, the, that just isn't, uh, the, the nature-based solutions don't acknowledge the scale of the problem that we've created. Lime uh, the, 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 it's one of the most common materials on earth. It does um, uh, ha have, have the uh, effect of uh, absorbing carbon and turning it into mineralization. But this is another uh, intervention like global carbon capture from the atmosphere that, that would be a huge industry all over the earth. And I don't think there's enough land on which to spread all of this lime to um, do, the, do, do, do the job that we would need it to do at the scale we would need it to do it. Other people talk about dumping lime into the ocean. Um, there are treaties against dumping wastes into the ocean. And it, it's not at all clear that the upsides of this, of that, would uh, outweigh the downsides. So again, we need to continue to search for solutions and be creative, but I'm not confident that either of those are the silver bullet. Now we've had uh, people like Professor Paul Barron from uh, Leiden University, and he's wrote a book called uh, The Best of Times, The Worst of Times. And you know, his pos position is that the future is so much more worse than IPC, uh, IPCC or anyone else have painted, and that we cannot even begin to fathom the kind of disaster that we're gonna be in, uh, both from just 
you know, drought, uh, you know, lands that you can't actually yield any kind of, you know, you know, useful uh, products to unlivable conditions and really ultimately affecting people uh, that's going to amount to deaths and you know, almost, you know, really not very survivable in certain parts of the world. Um, are we going to get to a point where the solutions aren't enough, can't scale and can't, ch- aren't cheap enough, can't be agreed upon? And we're going to get to a situation where uh, maybe it's next century, I don't know. Uh, we're going to have to really seriously think about is this continue to is this going to be habitable or do we need to leave this planet uh, and look for another home? I don't uh, have a lot of faith in the ability to move a significant portion of 10 billion people to some other planet. I think uh, even if a few people escape to somewhere else, the vast majority of humanity is going to have to make a stand here. And it's not that all, or it's unlikely that all of the earth becomes uninhabitable. It's more nearly that some places that are now habitable will become uninhabitable. Other places, Siberia and Canada might become more fertile, more suitable for agriculture. But how in the modern world would we organize the migration of one or two billion people from the global south to Canada and Siberia? That It's just impossible to imagine such a thing. Uh, or all of those people coming to Europe and North America, the U.S. Uh, for that matter. Um, so I, I don't, I'm more worried about nuclear war being the end of humanity than I am about climate change. Um, but I'm afraid that climate change does have the prospect anyway, the possibility of being much more destructive uh, to human societies, let alone ecosystems, than people are now imagining. And that's not a firm prediction. In this arena, we just need to think probabilistically. It, I'm not saying it's 100% likely that 2 billion people will need to migrate early in the next century. But if there's a 10 or 20% chance of so huge a catastrophe, that's certainly something that we should be trying to um, uh, head off at all costs. So just as a last comment, uh, first and foremost, my position is that uh, we have to take a stand here. And certainly this is our home planet and we have to make it work. Um, but I think you know, you know the, the complexity is that way before Earth becomes completely uh, inha- inhabitable is that the issue is um, because of scarcity, because of migration and movement of people, we're more likely to have escalation or engagements of war. Uh, and the conflict is going to rise. And really, that could be really the, the demise of humanity much faster, but really climate change is attributing to that. So with that, I've been joined by Wake Smith, lecturer at Yale College and the author of Pandora's Toolbox. Thanks for joining today. Very kind of you to have me. It's been fun. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.